we are going to transition to our next speaker, Alexander Ivanov. Alexander Ivanov is an associate professor here at Northeastern, who is, has been pushing the boundaries of separation technologies for peptides for a long time. And he has a joke that I love very much about decreasing flow rate that I'm not going to take away from him. Has something about taking it to the logical extreme of low flow, low flow until no flow, right? <laughs> but today he is going to share with us uh, uh, his his work. I'm sure there will be some low flow separations, high performance separations, and some other exciting results, maybe multimodal measurements. Look forward to hearing about it, Alexander. Thank you. I probably don't need that one, Rich. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, then. Uh, thank you, Nikolai, for your uh, invitation to the introduction. Uh, thank you for sticking around. So it's, uh, it's been a long day today. Yesterday, if you feel tired and you would like to stretch a little bit and walk around, please feel free. I will uh, not react on that. But anyway, um, so yes, we'll, uh, I'll be um, <clears throat> talking about separations coupled to mass spectrometry, and uh, we are also uh, interested in anal analysis of limited samples and uh, single cells, uh, definitely not uh, interested exactly replicating what Nikolai is doing, so we are on the same campus, and uh, so, but hopefully some of um, our work and uh, Nikolai's lab wor work will converge at uh, some point. So um, the basic two ideas that I would like or two uh, recent projects that I would like to share today are related to two questions. Uh, one is whether we can get to the uh, single cell analysis using um, at the glycomic profiling level and the top-down proteomic profiling <coughs> level. So, and um, I'll just focus today on these two topics and our initial results and proof of concept experiments that we recently conducted, some um, recently published, but most of them not. And um, definitely, let me see, uh, here <clears throat> I'll be presenting uh, work mainly done by Yunfan, Kendall, Enlis, Somak, and Michal. And uh, we tested different mod uh, modalities of uh, ultra low flow separations. And <clears throat> in addition to uh, stressing the point that uh, Nikolai stressed quite a few times already, um, the importance of bringing uh, single cell omic uh, analysis to uh, resolving biological <clears throat> questions, also, uh, that works. All right. Enough? Is it better? Yes. No. Is it on? It ah, uh, it is off. <laughs> uh, okay, better, right? Um, yeah, it's it helps typically. So um, one more point to stress, and uh, definitely clinical analysis has been mentioned and multiple disease models and so on. But uh, bringing a single cell anal analysis and anal analysis of uh, limited amount, limited samples uh, to uh, the clinical space is very important too. I'm not listing the uh, different applications here. Some of them uh, were um, mentioned before, like laser capture, micro dissection, and the challenges that we uh, discussed already during the last day and a half. To transition uh, to ultra low flow uh, separation, I, I, I'll not spend too much time. Yesterday, uh, Ryan, um, was it yesterday? It was yesterday, I think. Yes. <laughs> Ryan um, uh, nicely introduced the importance uh, importance um, benefits of ultra low flow separations. So he showed some examples at 20 uh, nanoliters per minute. Uh, we went down to <clears throat> five, two nanoliters per minute uh, uh, at different examples uh, and different applications. And uh, uh, the basic idea, and this slide was generated years ago, is to increase the uh, signal intensity in mass spectrometry by dropping the flow from let's say 60, 70 nanoliters down to <clears throat> 12 nanoliters per minute shown uh, at the uh, top trace. 
And we observe these uh, trends uh, using different modalities of separation. We are using different types of columns. We typically pack in uh, or make polymerize them in-house uh, using open tubular columns, especially porous layer open tubular columns. I'll talk about them in a little bit. Uh, monolithic columns, which I'll not, not talk probably today about packed columns. And also we are using capillary, uh, capillary electrophoresis coupled to mass spectrometry. And uh, the main reasons are listed there uh, for improving the signal, enhancing the signal in mass spectrometry. Basically, uh, better ion transfer efficiency, better ionization efficiency, and decreased ion separation. Uh, and also, we are trying to increase the separation efficiency there, so by different means. So. Um, Starting with the top down, and uh, definitely we were, were um, monitoring success of Neil Kelleher's group for years and years. And previously, uh, definitely it was, it seemed uh, impossible to get to the level of a few cells or single cell analysis uh, in uh, uh, top down proteomics. So, <clears throat> but recently, uh, about a year and a half, two years ago, um, uh, we uh, decided to try and uh, just to test whether we can get the cells uh, into the capillary electrophoresis, uh, get them lies there, analyzed, uh, and uh, similar to you've seen from your um, uh, presented earlier today. So the concept was to bring the intact cell into the separation device uh, to minimize the losses and just lies it right there on the column or in the capillary uh, to uh, start separation right away. And um, in top-down analysis, we uh, eliminated, of course, the, the digestion and even reduction step. Uh, the idea was to introduce the cell from a cell suspension into the uh, capillary, uh, surround that uh, plug of containing a cell or several cells with a lysis buffer, lies right there, and then separate and analyze by mass spectrometry. And we uh, tried a couple of approaches to introduce cells into the uh, capillary. Uh, the first one was uh, um, inspired by uh, Si Wu. I don't see her uh, today here. She was around yesterday. So uh, she uh, used this approach to analyze small molecules from plants, inject small molecules into the capillary from plants. So what we did, we basically put the droplets containing uh, uh, cells, cell suspension on the glass slide, uh, injected, uh, filled the capillary with background electrolyte, which we need for separation. And we are using here the capillaries with a sheathless uh, electrospray interface, uh, so-called Moini interface commercialized by Sykes. And uh, then injected the cells and injected uh, the second plug of the lysis buffer. Uh, and then after waiting for just a minute or two to get the cells lysed, we applied voltage, we enabled capillary electrophoresis separation and uh, coupled to mass spectrometry. <clears throat> so that was electrospray uh, ionization driven uh, cell injection. So as soon as we applied voltage here to generate electrospray uh, because of the um, uh, low conservation of mass, uh, the uh, capillary, um, the plug of buffer got mobilized so and it get moving and if the inlet was immersed in the uh, in the droplet it uh, sucked in cells from the droplets with suspended cells so and then uh, uh we at that time we could only time our injection we applied high voltage spray voltage and waited let's say for uh 30 seconds one minute two minutes and of course <clears throat> the number of cells injected in the uh, capillary varied from one injection to another, from one minute to two minutes. Of course, there was an increase <clears throat> in the number of cells. But uh, uh, we took it, uh, the capillary offline. We could visualize, we could count uh, the number of cells. So it was a proof of concept. Everything was injected pretty much manually, but uh, using the uh, instrument for applying high voltage. The second approach was to uh, 
inject using hydrodynamic or hydrostatic uh, difference in pressure. So when we had the outlet and the inlet of the cap capillary placed uh, on the same level, the same height, uh, the uh, background electrolyte in the capillary was not moving. As soon as we dropped the outlet of the capillary down a few centimeters, 40 centimeters, 60, depending on the instrument, uh, on the experiment. So uh, we got the injection going. And since we uh, did this manually under the microscope, we could immediately see, uh, we, can we could target the cell, we could inject the cell, one cell, if we wanted to inject 10 cells, we injected 10 cells, five cells, and so on. And then, uh, si since the cells were surrounded by the lysis buffer, typically it took about a minute or less to get them lysed. In those um, images, we had to inject just one plug of the lysis buffer, because uh, otherwise it was impossible to take pictures. Uh, the cells were disappearing in time, the experiment properly. Uh, the lysis um, was going on very quickly. Here we had just one plug <clears throat> of the uh, lysis buffer uh, from the outlet, from the inlet of the capillary, from this side. So, and the cell was um, labeled, so we could visualize. We, we knew that that's a single cell. And we could, could time. Uh, we, we knew that two minutes was totally sufficient to complete full lysis of the cell. And uh, so that's pretty much the same um, uh, images blown up a little bit to, to show a single cell how we um, could observe disappearance, lysis of the cell, and measure the time. And, <clears throat> and uh, then we uh, uh, separated protoforms. We, the signal was low. And, um, uh, and then we saw whether we can detect proteins, proteoforms, and um, the answer was that yes, we could, and we recently published that paper in the end of uh, a, few, a few months ago. We compared, uh, the question was also, or oh, maybe the cells got lysed there in the droplet or right <clears throat> in the suspension before that, and we are introducing background uh, noise and uh, proteins in each injection. So definitely we washed the cells, we injected the buffer as a negative control um, uh, from from the cell suspension after we washed them. So we had some um, contamination, but it was very low, the numbers. And then we, we compared injecting using electrospray mobilization, one minute, two minutes, and so on, or one by one cells uh, with the hydrodynamic injection. So the numbers were quite uh, um, low at this time, and uh, still we, we we are learning, it's a new field for us. We are waiting for uh, Neil's help with the software so our identification results can be improved, uh, mass spectrometry can be improved. But interestingly, if we expected to see uh, the mostly, uh, the highest abundance proteins which we did see in these experiments, we uh, also were able to get some of the proteins coming from two, three, and four orders of magnitude lower abundance. So, of course, the majority of them were small, uh, relatively small proteins, but that's uh, the limitation of the field currently. And uh, also, if you looked at the uh, cells and their sizes, their diameters, uh, there was some correlation between the numbers of protoforms, positive co correlation, numbers of uh, proto protoforms and proteins, <clears throat> and the size of the cell. So the, the larger the cell, the more protoforms we were getting. And um, um, then we moved on with, and uh, uh, we checked what we, are try, uh, what we are getting out. So not only protein IDs, but uh, definitely modifications, multiple modifications, protoforms. Some of them are shown here, uh, including the H4 histone. And now after playing with uh, top-down data, I see why people a lot of histones and top-down um, um, worlds because they're quite easy to ionize. They're small, they're nicely charged. And um, so various modifications were found. Uh, so protoform, intact protoform analysis is possible. So uh, at this stage, the numbers were um, about up to 60, 50 protoforms or so per, per cell but that's that's a start 
Another limitation there was for um, uh, caused by, by the data acquisition. So in uh, top-down proteomics, we had to sit on each peak for quite some time, 500 milliseconds and more, to generate uh, informative MSMS. Therefore, we couldn't get uh, that many MSMS spectra, and the overlap between different cells uh, was relatively small, uh, relatively low. And if uh, in bottom-up proteomics, uh, measure between runs and, and other approaches that you know, you've heard about uh, today, uh, allows to match features between multiple uh, cells, multiple injections. In top-down, uh, it's unavailable. We used uh, progenesis software from um, nonlinear dynamics now, Waters, and uh, it required uh, us to manually validate each of the matched features based on the charge state distribution, isotopic distribution, migration time. So it was very tedious work. Therefore, here I'm showing just examples for two types of <clears throat> cells and the cell number is very small. Three, indi four individual cells, three individual cells or so. And what it shows that the number of identification identifications expectedly increased when we used this ma uh, match between runs feature in the analysis. So it helped. It helped in definitely developing and uh, getting the software uh, to match features between multiple runs will incre increase the depth. And uh, the same pretty much uh, observation if you look at uh, four individual cells in this case, and look at the Venn diagram of IDs of proteoforms or proteins in between the cells. The overlaps are very small, but if we apply match between runs, uh, then it, the overlaps increase. Still not perfect, but uh, the quantitative analysis, even based on those features, and I think we use something like 79, 77 features altogether, it allowed us to uh, separate uh, two cell types. Yes, only three cells versus four cells for now proof of concept. Uh, and uh, uh, PCA uh, analysis get some separation too. Potentially uh, increasing the depth of this analysis will provide more informative single cell top-down proteomics characterization and uh, better statistical analysis in separating uh, molecular phen <laughs> phenotypes. <clears throat> Then, uh, since we are working with the different modalities of LC separation as well, uh, open uh, porous um, layer, open tubular columns, for example, and I'll show an image on the next slide. So we decided to uh, test whether we can use these columns that we polymerize in, in, our, in my lab. And uh, in this case, we, uh, we used FAMES and no FAMES and um, didn't publish it yet calls the very initial proof of principle uh, report, uh, very standard LCMS uh, configuration, but in order to get to uh, the flow rate of 20 nanoliters per minute or below, we had to split the flow. We loaded the uh, cells and samples at high flow rate on the trapping column, uh, but then uh, we enabled analytical separation at ultra low flow. 20 nanoliters per, uh, per minute or so. <clears throat> so that's how the uh, plot co column looks like. Uh, it's an um, uh, SEM image. So um, the column is 10 micron in diameter, and the porous layer is less than one micron, probably 0 0.5, 0 0.6 micron. Um, that's how it looks, and that's uh, porous with the small features. In this case, when we <clears throat> <clears throat> compared the <clears throat> ion density maps uh, with and without uh, the FAMES interface, you see that uh, as expected, and we had several papers on the FAMES interface uh, for bottom-up uh, applications, all these uh, streaking of polysiloxane ions, they're removed, and um, single charge contaminants and single charge ions are removed, but, and so the uh, and then steam maps and the signal and background noise is cleaned up, uh, looks much better. <clears throat> and then we played with optimization of compensation voltages and uh, got some gains, 45% uh, 
35 percent uh, for proteoforms um, proteins uh, for the uh, cell equivalent injection at this time 200 cells so we processed in bulk injected uh, uh, 200 cell equivalent uh, replicates uh, looked good good overlaps um, so some improvements was there and the uh, uh, for this amount of um, material, starting material, the uh, numbers of protoforms were quite okay. If you look at the uh, papers of the leaders uh, in the field with uh, uh, unlimited uh, amounts of samples and multiple samples, multiple runs, here um, those 15 and 1900 uh, protoforms from 200 cells, we were pleased to see, but that was the start. Another uh, uh, good uh, feature of this experiment was that <clears throat> if you looked at the reprodu reproducibility between replicates, the peaks were very sharp, first of all, and reproducible. Uh, so the plot columns work, so we need to keep moving in uh, this direction. And we were able to cover a substantial dynamic range if we mapped our uh, top down proteomics data to the existing. Uh, quantitative data published by um, Olson um, a, a few years ago. Uh, definitely, they used uh, bulk samples and um, uh, bottom-up proteomics. So uh, to follow up with that, we try to, <clears throat> uh, again, just a pilot experiment. We are working towards uh, improving this. Uh, in this case, uh, six cells were injected on the trapping column, lice processed right there, no digestion, and um, uh, then eluted on the uh, open tubular column, shown here. I think the column is three meter long, or in this case, maybe it was one meter, I don't remember uh, exactly. And um, uh, we got some results, protoforms. The numbers are very modest for now. Uh, 29 plus minus five proteins for this uh, few couple of experiments and uh, about uh, 30, uh, 40 plus uh, protoforms, but we are working on that. And <clears throat> definitely we, we could see even at that level intact protoforms, modifications, and uh, I will not go into details, but that was a conceptual uh, proof that we can move on in this direction and further improve. So it, uh, it's possible. We also mapped uh, to the bottom-up data, quantitative bottom-up data, uh, our quantitative results and identification results for proteins. Definitely, we are still up here. Sporadically, we are getting identifications for lower abundance proteins, <clears throat> but there is uh, definitely uh, hope uh, for improvement. Also, when we looked at protoforms, we noticed that we can get signatures of um, glycosylated uh, uh, protoforms, axonium ions and neutral losses, and uh, which brings me to the next <laughs> topic that I'll briefly overview. Uh, okay, then I'll speed up. Uh, here we use um, glycomic analysis, and we were first, we, we just recently published a paper, uh, Nature Communications, a, couple, a month ago, uh, where we um, basically moved from the Diuretization strategies uh, to label free analysis of released glycans and glycans. And um, with using that improved techniques, we were able to get down to the analysis sub nanoliter volumes of plasma. We were uh, impressed. Uh, so, with the numbers, it's like 200, 300 uh, proteins, uh, not proteins, uh, glycans at this stage. And uh, we could characterize quantitatively acylation, fucosylation, different uh, types of structures in plasma, in uh, uh, proteins, in that proteins IgM in here. And then we decided to couple the previously developed <clears throat> uh, single cell processing uh, followed by CE with glycan analysis using label-free approach. We inject the cell, process it in the capillary, analyze glycans, and um, that's what we saw. If you inject one cell, some sporadic peaks, but inject five, 10 cells, and we see more and more. And now we are working on identifying signatures. Actually, the numbers are right there. 
stem cells that that many glycans around 200 glycans and glycans we can read at the uh, at this stage for a single cell we are getting from 40 to 60 glycans but things are moving and uh, nice uh, traces in C uh, in this case uh, cell related <clears throat> glycans very informative MSMS fragmentation where we get signatures uh, characterizing linkages, linkage isomers, and uh, um, we are getting glycosidic uh, fragmentation, we are getting cross ring fragmentation, uh, very impressive. The numbers, uh, some of the numbers are shown there. And uh, a couple of <clears throat> last features here. If you look at the uh, two cell types, in this case, we were using either HELA or U87 uh, cells. And uh, I'm not a cell biologist, they look alike to me on those images that I grabbed from uh, ATCC in suspension when we leave them, uh, we trypsonize them. <clears throat> and they also look alike in the capillary, capillary, they look alike. When we analyze them quantitatively at the single cell level, uh, and we are getting those 40 to 60 glycans identified <clears throat> at that level, uh, we are, able to quantify them, we are able to cluster them in according to the cell type reliably. And um, uh, then even if you introduce treatments of the cells, so here we are comparing HeLa and U cells not treated and treated with LPS, uh, we see changes in fucosylation, changes in cellulation, uh, numbers, uh, abundance, and again, we are able to split them apart. And the uh, last uh, uh, vignette, so yesterday I talked about um, exosomes with so so someone. And uh, uh, we apply the same technique. We uh, inject uh, isolated EVs in the capillary, and uh, we could get to very uh, high numbers, over 300 uh, glycans identified in samples corresponding to low nanoliters of plasma. So <clears throat> with that, uh, also, low flow separations, there is uh, hope. Um, so we are actively working on that. I think we uh, can get benefits out of that. So I encourage uh, our PhD students and um, young investigators to not to be afraid of uh, simple, maybe, uh, proof of concept ex experiments. Uh, so all the uh, progress uh, starts right there. And um, also, Information uh, coming from uh, the analysis of PTMs, proteoforms, at the single cell level is important for uh, not only proteomic analysis, omic and other modalities combined, uh, so they can uh, help open new horizons. With that, I, I would like to thank my group, the funding, <clears throat> and if you are interested in learning more, uh, we'll be showing some um, more results at SMS starting in a couple of days and we'll be talking about top-down proteomics and cms at sms on monday as well thank you very much for your attention thank you alexander it's good to see the analysis of intact proteins advancing they already see a hand going up over there so we'll take the question Yeah, it's indeed good to see it. Uh, uh, so um, um, you, you, you said that you have to sit longer on every single precursor, like uh, you said 100 milliseconds, is that right? Uh, 500 plus. 500 plus. Yeah, you definitely can sit even more longer, I guess, than that. <laughs> uh, given especially how many precursors you ha actually have there. I mean, detectable precursors you have plenty of time. Yeah. Uh, Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm curious, um, so I mostly saw like B and Y ions, uh, why no ETD, especially if you still collect ions for like 500 milliseconds, ETD definitely can be done in that cycle time. Uh, I'm with you, we are testing it right now. <laughs> All right, and uh, one more question, so uh, is it an, an engineering challenge to put like a microscope camera and see capillary like at all times. So I do have to take it out all the time to see the cells. 
Uh, it is a, an engineering uh, challenge. We are working towards uh, automation. We are placing two cameras, uh, or uh, we are trying to get away with one, but we, we, we are also using two cameras. So we are moving towards automation, but it's definitely a challenge. It's not for an academic lab, it's a special one. So and we collaborate with industry on that too. And uh, uh, regarding the first question <laughs> about data acquisition, uh, yes, uh, probably smart uh, techniques for data dependent data acquisition will help too, because now we have these multiple chart states and we spend time on those and uh, it's just uh, definitely plenty of room for improvement. Yeah, the number one charge state actually comes because you use formic acid lasers. Actually, it's a very good lasers engine, which we cannot use in bottom up, of course, for the CDC, but uh, because you add so many proteins to your proteins, you have so many charge states. Yes, and uh, so the reality is that the, 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 yeah, the char many charge states, but at the same time, uh, they are quite stable, so we, we can get, uh, and the sensitivity is there. You saw a single single ion uh, detection mode, so there's potential, I think, there. What resolutions do you usually use? We uh, Typically, we start with the lowest possible uh, to get the um, highest uh, throughput, and then we moderately increase, but not uh, above probably 30K. So, but starts with low, low, and if the signal allows, we can go up, depending, but on a single cell level, not yet. But why do you have to start with low resolution if you still accumulate your ions for 100, 500 milliseconds? You definitely have time to spin them in the orbit trap. Um, in initial experiments, kind of in top down, usually that helps to get uh, better sensitivity and maybe decrease the time on. Uh, um, on, uh, in the orbit trap on the uh, acquiring transients, but when we know the distribution, we play with it. We, we go up and down, and uh, it's, of course, we are playing AGC versus uh, ion, injection, ion accumulation time and go back and forth. Thank you. Amazing talk. Hope to see continuation. Thank you. Uh, wonderful talk. Uh, um, so we have, uh, uh, I mean, you showed data here, uh, you know, with the uh, end link plaque oscillation. And uh, so the question was, we were also interested in looking at, uh, looking at some of these PTMs. And I was just curious why you only showed end linked and not O. Was there any reason uh, specifically? Uh, the most specific reason is the availability of high specificity enzyme, high efficiency enzyme to cleave N uh, glycans. With all glycans, our colleagues um, are here, John is there, he can sell some new enzymes from Genovis. So we are monitoring the situation. At some point, we will get there. Sure. No, it's a very important uh, area. Very, I mean, when you look at uh, O-linked, where phosphorylation can play a role, you know, at regulation. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, uh, so no, awesome, wonderful. Thank you. And by the way, I didn't mention that maybe on purpose, but now I decided to do that. Uh, actually, we are um, releasing glycans from the surface of the cell without touching the cell. So that's spatial uh, glycomic of single cell, first steps. Uh, great talk. Um, just a maybe a bit of an also a naive question. Are there uh, so those like forty four proteoforms or the numbers you report? Those are all like deterministically. You know, you feel confident. You know the exact sequence of the proteoform. Are there ever cases where you kind of know the protein it comes from, but you don't feel confident enough to sequence like exactly what the proteoform shape is? But you see, you know, differences. You can say this comes from this protein and then this other peak comes from this protein. We're not exactly sure the proteoform should, like, is there any range for incomplete information, but still that could be useful in sense? In this case, so again, we are, we are learning. We are relatively new in the field. Uh, we are using um, software which is available out there for free. And then with these um, numbers, low numbers, we are carefully checked manually. Uh, and um, um, as you may know, there are three levels of proto-form uh, confirmation or reliability of identification that definitely uh, 
we can go over uh, now. Yes, we look at MSMS, we look at assignments, we look at uh, if the, we identify a, a, a modification, we go back and look in, in the literature if it was reported before. And uh, this, for now, we are trying to play it safe, but um, there is plenty of room. Well, would you like to help us reanalyze the data? <laughs> you know, I wish I, I wish I could learn a bit more about the uh, tradition to top down workflow uh, because I'm more on the individual IM side of the lab. Uh, and actually, Kevin, Kevin Yos, who's uh, before he took off to Amsterdam, he gave me a wonderful tutorial on SESI MS, and uh, uh, it works uh, incredibly well for data. So I wonder if you're interested in doing single cell data top down. Very much so. Yeah. I think there's a lot of potential there. Yes. And uh, mm. we, we are um, now trying to publish a paper on native analysis of nearly one megadalton uh, complex. And even there, we are injecting just an equivalent of 200 cells for this humongous and look at uh, structural modification and changes what happens when nucleotide is attached, what happens when it interacts with other proteins. So um, yeah, so we'll look forward to collaborate. Uh, other questions for Alexander? All right. All right. Thank, Thank you, Alexander. You. Thanks.